right? So once we have brought people up to a standard of living where the multiplier is only two or three or four, then we need to answer that question. But we don't need to answer it now. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, maybe you're just worried about domestic needs going unmet, which is something to be worried about. There are kids in the United States who are sick, who don't get good educations, who need those things. Totally agree. There are already a lot of people who you know, no matter how you know, great a lecture I can give, there are a lot of people who are going to give to domestic causes. So it's not like we have a choice between ignoring people at home and helping people abroad. We know that the people at home are already going to get the lion's share of charity in the United States. So again, if we reach the point where almost all Americans are giving almost all their income abroad and people at home are really suffering, well, first of all, that's going to change the effectiveness ratios. Because right now, because people aren't spending money internationally, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. You know, tuberculosis really cost-effective to treat, and we just haven't spent the money we need to get rid of it. So once people start targeting their money over there, the low-hanging fruit will go away. It'll cost more money to make improvements out there. If people divert money from the United States to elsewhere, it'll start costing less to help people here because we'll get lower hand in fruit. And then, sure, you should go ahead and do it. But we're not there yet. Uh, so this is somewhat of a similar question, but it's mm -hmm. not weighing. But sure. So do you have any thoughts about how we can or should allocate our money to these different causes that all seem, in a sense, like equally as worthwhile? Mm -hmm. So like preventing death or advocating family planning or providing education, it seems like all those things would be, or they all have a good case, obviously, right, sure. for charity. Uh, but if we only gave of our 10%, like 3.3 to each one, then we'd be less effective in each category. But I mean, I don't know, so how do you? So that's a hard question. I think the answer is how much of a gambler are you? Mm -hmm. So what, so, so here's a mistake that a lot of people make. A lot of people who will look at a list of like the top 10 global health problems or something, and they'll say, I want to be as effective as I can. Mm -hmm. And the list will be like, number one problem is, you know, whatever tuberculosis, number two is worms, number three, whatever the list. And I'll say, okay, so I'll give 50% of my income to the number one thing, 30% to the number two thing, 20%, you know, whatever. Go down the list. If you're really interested in effectiveness, that's not right. You should give all of your income to the number one thing. Mm -hmm. If that's the most cost effective thing, then every extra dollar should be spent there. So I would say, if you're a gambler, you should look at the data out there, decide what you think the most serious problem is, whether you think it's education, lack of education, lack of nutrition, medical problem, malaria, whatever. Pick whatever it is, find the most effective charity at addressing that need, and, and give all your money there. Problem with that is, what if it turns out that we're wrong? We made some mistake in our calculation. As I said, these are not hard and fast and you know, very precise calculations. And in fact, I'll give you an example. Um, so if I had given this talk two months ago, all the health examples I would have used, I would have ended with, would have been deworming. So um, this big project called the Disease Control Prior Priorities Project, dedicated to getting this cost effectiveness data, concluded that the most effective health intervention was these, were these deworming pills, because they're so cheap. You don't save any lives, but you, know, you give a lot of small health benefits to a lot of people. So they calculated it that I think for something like Three dollars, you could add the equivalent of a healthy year onto someone's life. How they get that equivalency is a long question, but really cost-effective, more cost-effective than anything I put on the board here. Two months ago, a month and a half ago, Givewell, one of the organizations that I mentioned here, went through their data and determined they had made a calculation error. They were off, in fact, by a factor of I think a hundred. <laughs> Whoops, <laughs> right? So deworming is still as effective for education. We don't have any, problem, any reason to think that's not true. But in terms of its health benefits, it's not nearly as effective as people thought it was. So if you're not a gambler, if you're a little risk averse, then a better strategy might be to say, I don't know whether I think the biggest problem in the world right now is lack of education, overpopulation, deworming, malaria, whatever. So I'm going to divide my money between those things, figuring that even if we discover one of them is not being used well, I'll have done a lot of good elsewhere. So that's my answer, and you have to decide you know, how much of a camera you got. Um, on that subject, though, um, there's also some really good research um, into how um, essentially um, helping in one area will directly affect the others. Um, sure. So specifically with education, they found that, um, and especially with like, poverty and just general well-being of society, that if you can educate um, the women in a village, that will lead to better family um, planning. Um, and then that will also um, just generally raise income, um, empower women, and, and yeah. just general benefits. And so um, I believe the World Food Program right now um, has their um, One Cup program, uh -huh. um, where um, instead of just giving food, because it was, it was a whole other area of 
um, their program right now is just to, uh, if you go to school, you will get a cup of food. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, they've actually seen that um, in areas where traditionally it's 90% men that are in school, if yeah. people are attending school at all, suddenly now you're getting 40 to 50% women, mm -hmm. um, you're seeing uh, attendance rates increase, and, and that's the foundation um, for what, I mean, the future's going to be that they want. They need to be educated women and mm -hmm. society, and that's going to lead to family planning, and that's going to lead to longer lives, better lasting lives. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, if you, I don't, I don't know how far your money can go in a purely yeah. effectiveness argument um, mm -hmm. kind of way, but if you want to reach all these subjects, mm -hmm. it seems like um, education um, is a good way to start and feeding kids at school. Um, two birds with one time. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that what you're pointing to is something, I, I mentioned it briefly, but I kind of ignored it, one of the, I would say, frontiers in this kind of effectiveness research. So we have, and they're not always good ways, but we have ways to try to compare education, say, across cultures or across environments. One way is you look at days of schooling, like I was doing here. We have ways, and this is what I work on in my spare time, of comparing different health interventions. This is the philosophy of economics, the stuff I do. So it's easy enough to compare, well, this extends life about 10 years, this is only eight years, so this one's better. But what if this one cures blindness? Or what if this one you know, alleviates depression? How do we compare amongst those things? Really, really hard. I think economists don't do it well. But nevertheless, they do it. And so we have these overall measures of health where we compare and kind of go between all sorts of different health benefits that different interventions can have. As you're pointing out, be right. There are also benefits across areas from health to education and from education to health. So I put up the dewarming for education there, but of course dewarming has all sorts of health benefits. You're pointing out that education has a lot of health benefits too, because when the women are educated, you tend to, you know, people live longer, kids eat more nutritious food, they grow up better, all sorts of stuff. So there are a lot of things here, and so we don't, I don't know of anybody who really does even a halfway decent job of trying to measure the overall impact of these things. We found a poor common denominator amongst health. We found a common denominator amongst education, but we don't have a common denominator of health plus education. And it'd be really interesting to look at something like deworming versus something like a school meal program. Maybe one promotes education more and the other promotes health more. How would you kind of compare the two of them? And again, either one would be a great use of your money, but that would be a really interesting thing that I don't think anybody that I know of is working on right now. So, good point. I'm going to say let's um, end the Q&A for yeah. now. Anyone who wants to stick around and chat, you can do that. There's some food outside, which for silly reasons we can't bring in here. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so please join me in thanking you one more time.